Today is our penultimate lecturer. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about her. And let me remind you that if you're not using your computer like to take notes or something like that, if you would lower your screen. Well, just giving her talk, that would be great. It's just disconcerting to see a bunch of screens up in front of people's faces. Um, this is still not working. I'm just kind of talking through it. It is working? So I'll just, sorry, it's kind of silly to like. PhD in from Kansas City in 2001. And so another kind of interdisciplinary focus. We've seen a lot of that this semester. One area of interest is Latina and Native speakers. Ella Cara Deloria, Zoria Neal Hurston, uh, Yolita Gonzalez Mireles. History of Uh, and also one of the first archive projects that we've seen. And then it's no. project. Some of you may actually want to get involved with it um, after you hear me uh, present on it. Some of you may want to run quickly the other way. Um, but uh, I hope that um, I can tell you a little bit about, about, you know, or give you a sense of what digital humanities looks like in practice, like the actual nuts and bolts. So first of all, I want to get a sense of what you guys know already. Um, and does everyone know, or raise your hand if you know what Chicana means? Oh my goodness. Oh look, very good. You want to say what it, what it means? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, Mexican origin community, it's, uh, it's usually an appellation used. It emerges in the 60s, sort of like black, right? Emerges to replace um, previous terminology. It's a community origin term, so it's coming out of a radical community, radical political community um, of people coming to consciousness uh, about racism, about empire, about imperialism, a classism in the 1960s. The Chicano movement emerges alongside the women's liberation movement. How many of you are women's studies minors? OK, majors? <laughs> that was a little optimistic. Um, uh, you know, it, how many of you know about the women's liberation movement from the 1960s forward? Raise your hands high. Yeah, a little higher. Don't be shy. OK. So about, I would say about a tenth of the class knows about the women's liberation movement. Well, what, one thing you might know is that in the 1960s, there was a lot of social movement activity that emerged as a result of the Vietnam War, as a result of um, contradictions and problems around poverty in the US, around racism, really ignited by the civil rights movement, and particularly Martin Luther King and his sort of civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. Also, the United Farm Workers Movement, which sought rights for uh, farm laborers in California and Texas. Um, so there were all these, and, and the nonviolent, the student uh, nonviolence movement, the anti-war movement. So the research that I'm going to share with you really emerges from a very radical period in our history in the 1960s. Um, and um, 
essentially, it emerges for me, like where I come into this, is as a scholar and a teacher who teaches classes on the period in Latino studies and in women's studies. And in those classes, there are kind of the materials that were available to me to teach about the particular interventions that women of color made right, in those social movements. So we might think of women of color as being African American, Asian American, Native American, and Chicana, Latina women inside the women's movement, or those same women working inside any number of social movements focused on ethnic communities like the pl black liberation movement, um, Asian liberation movement, American Indian movement, Chicano movement. So I was very interested in recovering this history. And there's a personal reason for it that I'll get to in just a few minutes. But one of the problems I had teaching this history is there were no extant secondary materials that I could use to teach it. In other words, most of the materials about the Chicano movement focused on men who look just like this. Now, have, have any of you guys uh, seen uh, Black Panther iconography images? Share, raise your hands up high. All right, so you recognize what this looks like, right? These are community liberation uh, youth organizations that emerged in the 1960s in barrios and ghettos across America to defend. It's like a self-defense movement, right? But one of the things about these movements is they were very masculine. They were very masculinist. Their understanding of self-defense, as you can see, there's all men pictured here. What are they holding? Guns. Do you see the gun? <laughs> right, they're wearing berets. They all kind of look like Che Guevara. Most of the history that was written about this movement was written by the men who emerged from this movement. And that is why the history focus, tends to focus on the great leader tradition, right? This sort of narrative of great men leading the movement. You see the same thing, I think, in black power discourses. Now this is an interesting picture of a really important moment in the women's liberation movement. Do you see what they're doing in there? What does this trash can say? Do you know what they're putting in it? Bras. Say again? Bras. Bras. Has anyone heard the old, uh, the, the old chestnut that uh, feminists are a bunch of bra burners? Yeah? No? Yes? OK. Well, I'll go with uh, the ambivalence there. But uh, so what they're doing is this is an action that one of the first radical feminist actions, public actions, it's where that myth of women uh, feminists as bra burners come from. Right? It's an action and in 1968 that took place in Atlantic City in front of the Miss America contest, right? where feminists came and they were, they were supposed they couldn't get a fire permit, so they never actually burned anything. But they, they were supposed to be throwing makeup, high heels, bras into, um, into, a tra into a freedom trash can. And these were all symbols of patriarchy and the objectification of women. Well, so this narrative about women's liberation also has a very kind of narrow slant. And it tends to focus on the issues and the leaders who, uh, uh, that were usually regarded as sort of white middle class issues that were raised in the women's movement. And this narrative also excises the important work that women of color um, did in the 1960s. And so when I teach my women's studies classes or when I teach my Latino studies classes, there was nothing I could teach students like you um, that no materials existed that I could use to teach you about the more complex history of this period, the history of women who were, who were really caught in between, who were working both on feminist issues and working both on issues of racism um, and anti-war issues. And in as much as um, that narrative did include women of color, Usually, in both sort of narratives of the uh, social justice movements and narratives of women, women's liberation, um, people talk about 1981 and the publication of this book called This Bridge Called My Back, um, by, uh, writings by radical women of color who are actually writing about their position somehow between these ethnic st struggles and these feminist struggles, right? And so a lot of times writers or scholars will talk about women of color emerging as writerly beings um, in 1981. The only problem with that narrative is it's not true, right? Because there are books like these produced in the late 70s from work that was written for newspapers and in speeches in the early 70s that are also articulating uh, this particular positionality. And you know, uh, maybe you recognize, I did not write these books, by the way. I'm not that old. But 
these books, I knew they existed because they were in my mother's library. And the reason I knew they were in my mother's library is because she wrote them. Right? So I had personal knowledge that there was a vast history of women producing political work and engaging in political communities that was not being represented in our history books. And the reason why it wasn't being represented is that it basically existed in women's personal libraries and the keepsakes they, they held under their beds and in their offices. Um, this idea of triple jeopardy in the early 1970s where women of color began thinking about racism, imperialism, sexism, as combined factors leads to contemporary understandings, feminist theoretical understandings of a term called intersectionality, which is one of the most important theoretical insights that the women's movement has brought us. And it was brought to us uh, not by the men in ethnic nationalist civil rights struggles or by white women from the women's movement, but in fact by women of color working in between those two movements. And so my task was to sort of show the origin point of this idea of the triple oppression, i.e. intersectionality, um, at, as starting in a much earlier time than historians had previously understood. So if feminist historians and historians who are studying ethnic nationalist movements are saying, well, women of color emerged in the 1980s, we know, in fact, that, that women of color are writing about their unique positionality much, much earlier. And I'll just sort of highlight this. Rasa women, by Rasa women, she's talking about women inside of the Chicano movement uh, suffer a triple form of oppression as members of an oppressed nationality, i.e. racism, as workers, i.e. classism, and as women, i.e. sexism. Now, I'm not going to go through this timeline, but what I want to show you, the only thing I want to kind of tag with this timeline, and this is based on materials that we've uncovered. Oh, and let me backtrack a little bit. So I said that I was looking for materials that I could use to teach my students. And this is really important to understand why I, I'm doing this project. And I went to my mother's house and I started scanning things, right? And then I would uh, upload those to C-Tools, which we all love, and add them to the sort of list of official readings and have my students read, you know, materials like, sorry, we're going to take you back, like this magazine. Right? Instead of just telling them that this magazine existed, I would actually assign it as a reading alongside stuff that's sort of commonly taught about the period. And this is an important intervention because what I came to realize is that my students actually enjoyed reading the archive. That whereas they hated history, right, they actually enjoyed going back to primary documents and seeing the sort of artifact of history. And what they especially liked was the fact that a lot of these materials were produced by people their very same age, 40 years before. Right? So very radical political materials. Now, I just include this timeline so you guys can get a sense. Right? Let me go back to 67. Uh, this is drawn from the archive we've collected so far. Um, whereas people were telling me that there, or whereas the books, the history books were telling us that there was no history here. There's no history here. There's nothing. Once we started uncovering this archive, we realized that there was a tremendous and um, incredibly uh, nuanced history of political activism. And we weren't even looking at black women or Asian American women or Native American women. We were just looking at Chicanas. And we found so much. And you can see that by the sort of 70s and 80s, and this is a, another connected uh, sort of research interest of mine, you start seeing more material being produced and being printed. So you start uh, seeing the development of what historians, uh, feminist historians might call a print culture, right? Moving from activism on the ground, forming social organizations, doing consciousness raising sessions, having conferences, to actually creating a generation of women who are beginning to sort of think about these things and write books, right? And this is really important. So this is why you see this skewing in our historical narrative. Oh, women of color emerge in 1981, right? Because there's books that can document their emergence. But meanwhile, their documents are in basements, attics. Uh, the documents of the prehistory of those books are in basements, attics, and closets, and under beds and the like. So what we wanted to do with this project was collect that prehistory to show what stood behind a full 10, 15 years behind books, important books like this bridge, Call My Back, and to show the rich history of both feminist 
and ethnic nationalist social movements. The other thing we wanted to do is disrupt the sort of power dynamics of the archive. And I'm not going to get deep into this. There's a lot written about how the archive is an institution of power. All I need to say to you is imagine where archives are. Where are archives? Who can tell me? Where do you know? What, what, do you know where they exist? In libraries. In libraries. And where are libraries? Usually these archives don't usually exist in public libraries so much as what kind of library? University libraries. And who has access? Can anyone just walk into a university archive and say, I'd love to look at uh, the first copy of D.H. Lawrence's whatever? Can anyone just walk up off the street and look at that? Is it available? No. No. University libraries are closed spaces, right? Available to only very privileged people. And so what are the stakes of saying, well, I could go out and collect all of these documents and try to get them in a library, but then who would have access to them? And so it was really important for the project as a political intervention to make these documents available to the broadest um, and accessible to the broadest population possible. Um, because this is an archive of radical feminists of color. And so in order to respect where this archive comes from, we need to also respect the power dynamics of the archive and acknowledge them, right? And so our question was, can we create an archive that doesn't just reproduce power systems, but actually responds to the radical potential of the things that we want to create? And the idea we came up with was this uh, project Chicana por mi raza, which is a simple idea, really. Um, oh, it's a web-based archive that documents uh, the development of Chicana feminist thought and praxis, sort of like that timeline I showed you, right? Uh, by collecting documents out of print books, newspapers, reports, leaflets, and other material culture called from personal collections. Um, we would also collect oral histories we proposed and even secondary sources, i.e. Uh, include in our website essays, articles, and even books on this history as they begin to emerge. Because remember that at the point when we started this archive, there was nothing. Like, it was a blank slate. Since we've been working on the archive with a collective, a national collective of, of scholars, a lot of material has, been, has started to be produced about this history. So this also shows you the power of the archive to begin to generate right, historical narratives and to shift the historical scene. Um, so our project goals are pretty simple. We digitize primary archival materials, many of which we find in private collections. These would be newspapers, photographs, letters, uh, documents of different sorts. Um, and the way we find these is that we identify women to conduct oral histories with. We've done about 50 or so, so far, since 2010. Um, and many times, those women might have two or three or four documents. Maybe they have a poster from the 60s. Maybe they have a collection of political buttons, right? And so we take our little scanner, and it's not a little scanner, our big scanner, and we, working with students, we start scanning this material and putting it into a database. Um, our goal is to develop an educational website in which the oral histories and the digital archives can be accessed and searched, um, including you know, different kinds of material culture items. And so we, see, we, we envision a broad array of items available. And some interactive tools, timeline tools, mapping tools, where you could insert data and pull from the archive, right? the tagging in the archive. Um, another important goal is to create a national collaboratory for the production, development, and dissemination of new scholarship. And I'm going to talk about that uh, sort of towards the end of the lecture. And also develop a, a set of course models that will enable teachers in a broad variety of settings to use the archive and add to it. So this might be giving, assigning a, a classroom a special research assignment where they go into the archive and they produce material based on what they find in the archive. Or it might actually be having a small class of students go and do local oral histories in their community and do the archival collection process themselves and then add it to the National Archive. So we're thinking about this archive as being developed as a crowd, kind of a, along a crowdsourcing model. So I've talked a little bit about the importance of why this history needs to be told, but I want to talk about why tell it through a digital archive. Like, what is at stake with this approach? Um, I, and, and I sort of 
touched on this before, but there's what this little sort of uh, issue of scholarly neglect, right? So most of you aren't librarians, I'm assuming. <laughs> most of you don't work in archives. But you know, when you have institutional archives, like here at the University of Michigan, um, in order to go collect a very large collection of papers, right, and to put all the labor into that, you have to make, a, a, uh, you have to make an argument to the people who are dispersing money. Right, because space is primary here for archives. So you also don't want to waste a bunch of space on something that's not that interesting to scholars. Can anyone here uh, sort of figure out or guess why, if you're not in any history books, a librarian might say, you know what, I don't think, I don't think we should collect this. I don't think we should waste the resources on this. Right? This is what we're calling the scholarly feedback loop. If you're not in the history books, no library is going to say, yes, let's dedicate resources and space to this and time. But what happens if you're not in the library, if you're not in the archive? What? Exactly. Because we all know. Are you a historian? No. Not yet. Um, <laughs> uh, and anyone here interested in history? Very tentative. Kind of. Right. History is made from the archive. History is made from, through the process of historians walking into a library, looking at a set of documents, and then telling a narrative about a, a time in the past based on those documents. So if you're not in those books, a librarian can't make the argument that you ought to be in the library. And if you're not in the library, you're not in those books. Right? So that's the primary reason why we need a digital archive of this sort of lost history. But there's another issue, and that is the issue that I touched on earlier, which is the issue of access. Many of the women we interviewed, we interviewed had not wanted to give their archives, even when librarians asked for them, because they didn't like the idea of the archive being kind of locked in this magic tower that the people in their communities, the communities that they're still struggling for, could never access. Um, and that is why we talk about democratizing the archive, transforming knowledge relations through um, things like uh, crowdsourcing the archive, like opening up the archive so that scholars, not just institutionally recognized scholars and historians at places like U, U of M, but scholars, community organizations, could not just access the archive, but also potentially, if you have a community organization that's been active since the 60s and you have an archive there, that we could give you the tools to scan that archive and upload it and add, right? Because there's only so many resources I and my collaborators can dedicate to this. So the idea of democratizing the archive means making it open to flows, right? Both in terms of people accessing it, but in terms of people contributing to it. Um, and finally, there's a DH, a digital humanities term, virtual reunification, which basically just references what happens when libraries decide to form collections across the boundaries of nation, temporal, or sorry, not temporal, geographic boundaries. So take, for example, the, um, the, oh gosh, I can't remember his name, the Whitman, the Walt Whitman archive. That is a virtual reuni reunification process because Walt, Walt Whitman has archives in 22 different locations. And so all of these libraries got together and decided that they were going to bring this archive, create one massive digital archive. And what they did is they all scanned their Walt Whitman documents. And now you can search uh, across all of these different libraries. Um, and so we wanted to do that, except with women who had once known each other and networked and been involved in conferences and marches and strikes who were now dispersed, who originally had exchanged information and materials, but were now no longer, you know, they, they're in their 70s. Um, and we, what, what we wanted to do was to kind of recreate this activist network through the process of virtual reunification. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what virtual reunification and why it can do for us and why digital humanities is so important when we apply it to archival collection. Um, and, um, and also the production of history. And so I'm going to talk about three different areas that it, uh, where it really expands our understanding of the archive. Breadth, depth, and the connectivities uh, that we can imagine. And I'm going to do this by showing you some of the objects uh, we have collected so far. So breadth, what do I mean by this? Well, if it, you know, when you write a history uh, about, let's say, even if I were going to write a history about the Chicana movement, right? This is a national movement. It's very broad in scale. 
in the 1960s and 70s. There's hundreds of organizations located in many different places. Um, there's thousands of women involved in this movement. But if I were going to write a book about it, I would probably have to sort of focus, right, because I have about 250 pages. That's how much, how long books are, history books. I would probably have to focus on one or two organizations or one region or one woman, right, or a, a group of women. Um, what, what the virtual archive does for us is it allows us to have this massive breadth, right, that we could not actually have as historians writing books. For example, there is a rad you, nobody in this room knows this, I'm sure, but there was a radical third party that emerged in the late 1960s in South Texas called the Raso Unida Party, the United Race Party. They ended up taking over um, a town that was Mexican dominant uh, through ele the electoral process, and they originated because neither the Democratic nor the Republican Party were addressing the needs of Latinos in South Texas. And at this time in South Texas in 68, you got to understand it was like the Deep South, right? People were facing uh, police brutality. They were facing poll taxes, all the same things you might have seen in Montgomery, Alabama. Mexicans in South Texas were facing. So you see the rise of this political party. One of the things that we did was we interviewed a bunch of women who were active in this political party, in the Rasunida party. And what we discovered was that even though the men were in the leadership and doing all the press conferences, it was the women who were organizing all of the political campaigns and doing all of the sort of leafleting and working and talking to families and stuff like that. And, and so we uh, digitized this memo. The other thing I, I think is really interesting about this memo, so just a little background. Ramsey Muniz ran for governor of Texas um, in 1972 under the Raza Unida Party ticket, this radical third party. They were called communists. They were you know, associated with Cuba. That, none of this was true, but that's kind of the smear campaign. Anyway, he, uh, a young woman who we interviewed, a young woman at the time who we interviewed a few years back um, named Evie Chapa ran his campaign. And this is her press release procedure that she wrote out on a piece of paper, right? And you can see what I love about this document is it shows us what you know, politics might have looked like before the age of Facebook, right? So this is what you do. You have to take the call from the uh, national campaign leader, Carlos Guerra. You have to write down a press release, right? You have to mimeograph, because before copiers, there were mimeograph machines, produce 20 copies, take it, walk it over to the Capitol press room, leave a copy in each mailbox, and go home satisfied with the job well done. And of course, see this at the top? Don't fuck it up. Um, I'm going to go back here for a second and scale out. Um, the other thing we discovered is that even though the great leaders, the guy who ran for you know, governor, actually the, there was a woman who was under the age of uh, filing who nevertheless ran for lieutenant governor with Ramsey Muniz, and we interviewed her. Her name was Alma Canales. Um, but what we discovered is that on the local level, it was almost all women that were campaigning for county clerk, county commissioner, and the sort of local level uh, political activities, which was another really important insight. Oopsie. Sorry. Here we go. The other organization um, I wanted to talk to you about is an organization like the Black Panthers that emerges in LA called the Brown Berets. They were really inspired by the community self-defense um, sort of goals of the Black Panther Party um, and they organized all sorts of things like breakfast uh, programs and free clinics and uh, health clinics and uh, soup kitchens and most of this organizing work, indeed all of it, was done by women. And here they are doing a mailer. This is one of the women. We interviewed a woman named Gloria Arianes who talked about her work with the Brown Berets. This is the free clinic. This is Gloria and her friends on a, 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 a float. For I think, I can't remember for what march. And now I want to draw your attention to this. So at some point in the 1970s, uh, women got really fed up inside the Brown Berets. They were getting sexual harassment. Uh, they were facing sexual harassment issues. They couldn't move into leadership. 
Now, some of you guys know that the Black Panthers had this sort of, uh, they had a minister, like they had this uh, hierarchical organization where you would have ministers of self-defense, ministers of education, ministers of community uh, work. And uh, the woman we interviewed, Gloria Arianes, was the Minister of Correspondence. Yeah, the Minister of Correspondence. So you can guess, she was the only female minister in the Brown Berets. What might someone, the Minister of Correspondence, be uh, tasked with? Anyone? You can guess. Secretarial work? Right, so in a nod to be more inclusive in their hierarchy, they got Gloria to be the secretary and called her the Minister of Correspondence. But by the time this letter was written in 1970, women began getting really fed up with the fact that men in leadership were always taking the mic whenever there was a march, that men in leadership were sexually harassing them on a regular basis and in some cases even committing sexual violence. And the straw that broke the camel's back was in the, in the program that they started, the free clinic, they had asked the men because there was a lot of police surveillance of the Brown Berets, just as there were of the Black Panthers. And they'd ask the men to stay away from the clinic, to not have meetings there, to not congregate there, because the clinic was for women and children. And they were getting a lot of police um, harassment there. And the men refused. Um, and so the women, all of the members of the Brown Beret Party, resigned en masse. And this one little passage uh, gives you a sense of the kind of discourse that was operationalized at the time. All Brown Beret women have resigned from further duties in our organization. We've been treated as nothings and not as revolutionary sisters, which means the resolution that all our macho men voted for have been disregarded. We found that the Brown Beret men have oppressed us more than the pig system has, which in the eyes of revolutionaries is a serious charge. Therefore, we have, found, we have agreed and found it necessary to resign and possibly do our own thing. So, um, here women are saying that they want to organize by, their, by themselves and they in fact do form an organization very short-lived called the Adelita Zeslan. Um, and you can see, how did they sign off? Can you read that? Con Che. Do you know who's Che? Who are they referring to? Che Guevara, the revolutionary, one of the revolutionary heroes of the Cuban Revolution. Right, so this also gives you a sense of the sort of third world kind of, um, third world being in the third world liberation sense. Uh, solidarities that these activists are imagining. We have also collected the archive of Alicia Escalante, who was the founder of the East LA Welfare Rights Organization. Those of you interested in feminist history will probably be familiar with this woman pictured up there. That's Johnny Tillman, who's the founder of the National Welfare Rights Organization, an organization really founded by black women in the mid-1960s. Um, Alicia Escalante, whom we interviewed in Sacramento, uh, was a mentee to Johnny Tillman and was encouraged by Johnny Tillman to start uh, the East LA uh, welfare rights organization that focused on the needs of women, At one, uh, uh, Chicanas particularly in LA. She was, uh, actually her husband was incarcerated when she took this on. She had five children and she was living in a housing project and nevertheless was able to form this organization and tour the world, in fact, as one of the leaders of the newly birthed welfare rights uh, movement. She was also subject to police harassment, as you can see in this flyer, was jailed um, for uh, punching a policeman <laughs> so, <laughs> in self-defense. Um, I'm not going to get drilled down really deep um, into this, but uh, we have been doing a lot of collecting in the Midwest, and there's a very, very rich um, An unacknowledged history here. Um, I will look at one document because it's important, um, and that is that in 1972, Jose Angel Gutierrez, who was the founder of the Raza Unida Party in South Texas, starts to come up to the Midwest to see if he can get the Raza Unida Party established in places like Michigan and Wisconsin. And so they have this big meeting. And um, Jane Gutierrez, who has since died, unfortunately, she died before we could interview her, um, met with him and uh, decided that she did not like that the fact that at this big meeting where they wanted to get the Raza Unida Party started, it was all men speakers. And so she was like, well, now, wait a minute. We're not going to replicate that old boy system up here. And so she decides to hold her own conference, which she organized two for two months later. Um, 
which was this really important conference um, uh, that was called Adelante Mujer. And out of it spun like three or four different organizations, some of which, anyone from Chicago here? OK, some of which are still active in Chicago in particular, Mujeres Latinas en Acción, which is very unusual because a lot of the feminist um, social service agencies that, ha that emerged in the late 1960s and 70s went out of business in the 80s um, when Reagan defunded a bunch of different uh, you know, funding streams. So this organization that emerged from there is still going on. Now, in this picture, um, women, some, we've interviewed four of the women in this picture. This is Jan Jane Gonzalez, who organized the conference, who, who died in the 90s, I believe. Ruth Rea Mojica Hammer, who's the first Latino to run for a congressional district in Illinois. Marta Cotera, who's my mother, the writer of Dios I Embra, Chicana feminist, leading Chicana feminist um, voice. Olga uh, Villa and Lupe Anguiano. They're all major leaders in the Chicana feminist movement, and they all come together in the Midwest. And as a result of that, you have organizations like Mujeres Unidas de Michigan, um, right here in Detroit and in Lansing, um, having meetings and organizational and consciousness, consciousness raising sessions um, right here in the Midwest. And here are some sort of things. We've interviewed uh, Virginia Martinez, who was one of the, she was the first lawyer, Latino, uh, female Latino lawyer in Illinois. Ruth Mojica Hammer, who, as I said, ran for Congressional District 6. Um, a bunch of neighborhood women involved in different neighborhood organizations in, in Chicago, Pilsen Neighbors, um, and others. And in Wisconsin, what's interesting about Wisconsin, let's see if I can hone in on this. Um, you have a very early emergence of women of color uh, as, in Wisconsin, you have the organization of women of color across sort of ethnic and race uh, identities um, very early on coming together, um, many of whom were lesbians. So you have very, very early lesbian organizing around women of color issues. And we've uncovered that uh, due to a sister project um, that we have ongoing in Wisconsin. I love this picture. Look at this. We've interviewed both of these women in Wisconsin. They're female brown berets. They're on a march uh, for farm labor organizing um, in, uh, where is it? Wisconsin, <laughs> where the University of Wisconsin is? Madison. Thank you. Yes, Madison. OK, so I've talked about the enormous breadth that this archive gives us as historians. But I also want to talk about depth. And what I mean by that is that we can really drill down with this kind of uh, archive. For one, we can provide people access, teachers like myself, to books. So this isn't just an archive of images. What we want to do is create a lending library. So these are full, of all of these books that I'm showing you, um, they're full press uh, or full page, multi-page documents um, that you could essentially download and read, kind of like uh, Google Books. But they're very, very rare. Like, there might have been maybe 100 of these produced. And the way they would have gotten distributed is whenever there was a feminist conference or a Chicano conference or a woman of color conference, someone would have had to go and put them on a table for someone to purchase, right? So they're extraordinarily rare. Um, and we might find one copy in a woman's archive, like nationally, right? So creating a format for the, or a platform for these kinds of books to be checked out by your teachers and to be given to you as resources, right, is tremendously important and it's hugely valuable. Um, we've also got, these are very early print journals Right, these are emerging in like 70 and 71. And you can see, oops, oh, now comes a good part of the show where I let my hair down. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> um, I'll let you look at those images while I take care of my uh, situation. So these Regeneración and Encuentro Femenil have been written about scholars, about by scholars, but they haven't up until now been available in digital form. We can also, when we talk about getting in depth, you know, I talked about uh, providing access to books that were printed at the time that are now out of print. We can also look at important events 
in this history, like uh, this really important uh, conference that was held in Houston in 1971. Um, a recently published book, Chicana Power, by a historian named Maylee Blackwell, recovers this conference and its importance in terms of national Chicana history. Um, and part of that book, she collected all of this archive, which has now been donated to our archive. This is the book. Uh, we have interviews with both the organizer of the conference and women who attended. Um, this is a flyer from the conference. You can see it was held at the YWCA. Letters, keynote speakers and their sort of bios, photographs. So when I say we can get deep, I mean, this is deep, right? This is everything you ever wanted to know about this obscure conference that nobody until Maylee Blackwell had ever written about. And this is a conference program. Oh, this is an interesting document. Uh, let's see if we can get in close. Um, this was a workshop on the Chicana and sex that got a lot of women all riled up and angry. You know, and basically the protest about, you know, Chicanas, like, why are we, like all those white feminists talking about our orgasms when our men are dying in the streets, right? Um, there was a protest organized around this, this workshop. Um, and a lot of the Chicanas walked out. And historians like Melee Blackwell believe that it was over this issue of sexuality Right, that, that this issue of sexuality prevented the formation of a national organization for Chicana, somewhat like the National Organization of Women or some other national organization. So it's a really important historical moment. What May Lee has, um, which she has contributed to our archive, is 67 of these questionnaires about sexuality <laughs> that were distributed at the conference and filled out. Of course, their names, they're anonymous. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of depth. Now, what else does the virtual, does the digital humanities provide us in this virtual reunification process? Connection. And, um, you know, we understand connection in a kind of multifaceted way. So first, as you've probably learned, um, no digital humanities project can happen without um, a, a reframing of how we do our work as scholars. So the classic image of the scholar right, is me going up into my ivy-covered co office, right, investigating in the archive and then writing my personal conclusions about what the archive tells me. But n digital archives cannot be produced under those circumstances. It totally reframes how you do your scholarship because you need to be working with engineers, i.e. geeks. You need to be working with libraries, right, and special collections. And you need to be working with other scholars to co-produce uh, knowledge. For example, our cyber infrastructure, right? That's basically what enables the, the data to, 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 be, um, to be used, um, has been developed by the Institute for Computing in the Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, which is not here at Michigan, but at UIUC. And we've been given two terabytes of server space to hold our videos and our documents with the National Center for Applied Supercomputing. So as you can see already, in order to make this project happen, we can't just stick here at the campus. We have to sort of form collaborations to develop our cyber infrastructure um, across campuses. We also imagine um, this sort of scholarly hub, right? So this project is more than just a one-off project. We see it as the potential to bring ongoing digital projects that are doing kind of the same kind of work in the same thematic areas into relationship or connection through the internet. We have supported, um, so graduate research, like, you know, I have, I work with graduate students all over the country, all of whom are interested in one thing, and that is helping us recover this history. Um, and as a result of their work with us, right, so we might be working together remotely. They might be working in their own little town, let's say Kenosha, Wisconsin, collecting, doing oral histories and collecting material that they later move on to the uh, website and add to, you know, to, to our digital archive. And so even though those are not graduate students that I would be mentoring here at the University of Michigan, um, a project like this enables us to create trans-local um, right, uh, mentoring-mentee relationships. And I think the same thing goes for undergraduates, frankly. 
It also enables us to reach out to those community organizations like Mujeres Latinas en Acción and any number of community organizations that might have older archives to help them in their preservation of their particular institutional history. So uh, let's say Mujeres Latinas en Acción, if they wanted to scan their archive and preserve it through the Chicana por mi Raza digital collection, they could do that. And so our sort of impulse is once we get our collection stabilized, we're going to start reaching out to community organizations and forming partnerships with them. And finally, uh, this whole notion of service learning. I taught a class last fall where I was going to use the class to uh, collect materials from here in Michigan, actually southeastern Michigan. And so I had about 10 students and we did four oral histories and collected, I don't know, nearly 500 documents. And the students scanned about half of those and we're busy scanning the rest of them. So the students learned everything from how to do a videotaped oral history, how to scan and digitize objects, how to interface with the Medici system. So we used the students to kind of beta test how easy this would be. And what we've done is created a series of workshops that we have been taking nationally to other universities, universities in Texas, um, UIC in Chicago, and training them in how they would create classes similar to the one that I taught. And another way we might think about connection is that I talked about all these older women now. They used to be young women, just like you. <laughs> now they are older because it's 40 years later. But they used to come together in organizations or through print or through sending each other letters or through going to conferences together. And so what we are doing by having them recount their lives as, as political beings is you know, what we found is that in this web of connection, they'll often talk about each other. I remember going to this workshop that Marta Cotera taught, and it blew my mind, right? That's Olga Villa up there. It's basically, in her oral history, she talks about being introduced to feminist ideas through a Chicana lens uh, by my mother, who was at that Midwestern conference, right? So what we begin to see when we start putting these women into conversation is a very rich web of connection, right, that really enlivens our history. Um, and I want to talk about one final form of connection, and that's the cross-generational connections uh, that can be created through real-world research. So from the very beginning, I've worked with Europe students. In our very first research collecting trip in 2010, I took students to my mother's house uh, in Austin, where they scanned archives in her home. We did an oral history with a bunch of Texas women, a bunch of different oral histories. This woman is Carolyn Racine. She was a Europe student that year. She came, traveled with me to Austin. This is my mother. We're in the Benson Latin American collection doing some background, um, an archive dig there. This is us in California. So if you can believe it, I rented a van in California, took three Europe students, a videographer, and my mother on a week and a half long trip to interview seven different women across California. And it almost killed me. Um, and this, I think this picture gives you a great image of what the archives that we are in look like. They don't look like library archives, right? They're not all organized in neat little boxes. This is Yoli Alanis's um, garage, a lifelong socialist, right, who ended her oral history with, uh, the revolution is not over. That was the end of her oral history. She was amazing. And this is another Europe student in her living room uh, scanning buttons, right? So we have this whole collection of buttons in our archive. This is Marta Cotera, my mother, and Evie Chapa, whose memo on how to take a press release, how to handle a press release, I showed you at the beginning of this lecture. And they're laughing at something my mom said in an interview. This is us in LA with those three Europe students I talked about, um, Adonia Artiaga. Maria Flores and Carolyn Racine talking to Ana Nieto Gomez, the founder of the first uh, Chicana feminist organization. And this is us in the uh, garden of Betita Martinez, who was active in the Student for Nonviolent Co Nonviolence Coordinating Committee in New York, uh, the Reclamation of Land Committee in New Mexico, um, and all sorts of social justice uh, initiatives. She ran for governor of uh, California under the Peace and Justice a coalition uh, party. Um, and we're in her backyard. We spent two days with her. She finally got that necklace from me. She kept saying how much she liked it and finally had to just hand it to her. <laughs> 
Um, and I'm going to finish up with this uh, image. I'm going to move on to one more, but I want to hold off on that for a second. This is one of the students in uh, my mother's archive. And we went to Austin. Any of you guys ever been to Austin? Right. You know it's pretty fun, right? It's a pretty fun place. Yeah. So it's my hometown. So we were there for about a week. And every night I would say to them, you know, around 6 o'clock, like, get out. Go have something to eat. You know, you can have the rental car, please. It's the funnest town you can be in in Texas. And the students would just stay in my mother's library. And when I would come home at like 2 AM, they'd still be looking at archives, right? And finally, on the last night, I just insisted. I'm like, you guys, you can't just sit in here and geek out on archives. Believe it or not, they did this for four days, right? I forced them to go out. They agreed. They came back at 2 AM with this. <laughs> now. These, this iconography may seem familiar because it's pulled directly from the archives that they were engaging with. And they were so moved, right, by these images and this world that was opened up to them uh, that they actually got uh, images drawn directly from radical newspapers that they were looking at um, permanently inked onto their bodies. <laughs> and the funny story is, uh, this is Carolyn, she was like a radical farmer person. And uh, when her mother dropped her off at my house right before our Austin trip in 2010, she said, Carolyn, she's never been out of the state. Nothing will happen to her, right? And I was like, no, we're staying at my mother's house. It'll be wonderful. She'll be well taken care of. And so when I saw this, I begged Carolyn not to show her mother right away. So, oh, yeah, let's go back there. That is um, a woman. It says, Viva Feminista, so long live the feminist. She's got a rifle in one hand and some wheat in the other. Um, I think the question was also, where was it on? Oh, where was it on her body? Oh, you can see. It's about this big from here to here. <laughs> Hence why she came home at 3 AM. Ah. Oh, so this. Uh, is a kind of guiding motto for what we're trying to do with the archive and how we're kind of trying to mess with it a little bit. Um, and it's all really about autonomy and the right um, to tell your own history in the way that, that you need to tell it and to make that history available, right? And this is a quote from my mother uh, in an address that she made in 1975. And basically she says, what we are is what we decide we are and what we do with our identity is also our own decision, not the decision of men, the universities, her stories, histories, or anyone else. And so I leave you with that, because ultimately, you know, what we're doing is an extra institutional, right? It's not necessarily, it's funded by the institution to a certain extent, but it's not inside of the institution. Um, and it's an impulse to sort of both create an autonomous history, to correct um, a problem in history, a gap in history, but also to do so respecting and putting forward, right, at the front, the desires um, of these women that we're documenting in their world to tell their own story in their own language, in their own way. So, yeah, that's where. Thank you. So, are there any questions? Yes. So um, right now, the archive, so we, since 2010, we've been collecting the archive. And uh, so we just got some money from the National Center for Institutional Diversity to actually create a public face for our archives. So essentially what we have now is a login, right, um, that you could only access if you contacted me or one of the other people that is sort of the, at the head of the project to use in class. Um, and so right now, it's not a public site. So if you look it up, it, n you wouldn't find it. But what we got money to do was to create a public face for the site, to create an interface that people could access by requesting a login from the site managers, and uh, to also add on to that site a series of WikiHow videos. So you guys have probably seen these on YouTube. Like, you know, you can, uh, you can learn everything on YouTube in like two minutes or less. 
um, by just you know figuring out like there's there's all these how-to videos right and so what we want to do is create a set of guidelines for classes um, on how to use the archive but also how to kind of bootstrap your own community history project in your own location and so that would include basic information on like you know how to scan at the proper DPI you know how to interface with the Medici collection so we're this summer is where the big push to take it to a public facing site uh, will happen. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I know you were talking about how a lot, like all this information is basically not included in any history book, and that's why you made the archive. But have you ever thought about making a history like a textbook? There's nothing that the university would like me to do better than to actually write a scholarly book. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you know. Um, I think one of the challenges of creating a textbook that people could by um, is that the as I said before the information the archive is very vast like there's quite a few documents in it and we also have those like full books right and so yeah we could do this kind of overview of history but it would always tend to focus and this is the other thing I didn't really talk about this but just as there's great histories of great men in the social movements really uh, the people who have the loudest microphone Right, are the people who actually wrote, who produced text, who produced letters, who, who documented their own existence. Right? And so a, a textbook would tend to favor the textuality right, of the people who, whose names appear in print already, because it's an archive. The wonderful thing about the oral histories is that then we can introduce women who do, may not have an archive. They may not have documents, or they may not appear in the documents, but their storytelling installs them inside of that. And sure, we could actually transcribe, and we are transcribing all the oral histories right now. Um, but it would be so hard to put it in one book. And I think, in fact, textbooks, as you guys probably are already well aware, we're moving into a digital modality for textbooks. And it makes no sense, really, to publish uh, three-dimensional textbooks in real space. I mean, there's so much more you can do online, I think. So yeah, but thanks for asking that. I mean, the, you know, and the college does want me to write some kind of, it goes against the grain for me, but they want me to produce some scholarly text that somehow shows this work in a different face. But it's, it's an interesting thing for us to ponder moving. Any of you interested in getting a PhD in the humanities, a book writing, academic culture? Let's see some brave hands. Come on. There's got to be a few PhDs in the room. Okay. And what field? Okay, so I mean, I guess that's more of an article based, yeah. So in the humanities, you know, you're expected to write books, to get jobs, to get promotions. Um, but the humanities value system, the scholarly value system, is really coming up against a challenge, right? Because books may not be what the humanities does in 20 years. In fact, I really doubt it, right? So. People like me, and this is not to do any special pleading, but we're kind of at the leading edge. And so we're coming up against a value system for promotion that um, is still kind of in what we call the, the print culture mode, as opposed to the post-print academic culture mode, which is the mode we're moving into. So, you know, it's a great question. Thanks. Any other questions? You can, these can be also just pragmatic questions. like. I will be teaching a class this fall. <laughs> it's, uh, again, a workshop-based class. We'll be working with the archive. We'll be adding to the archive. We'll be doing oral, oral histories. You will get training in how to, do, how to videotape and conduct an oral history, how to digitize, how to do all of these things that we do that I've been taking your op students to do for like four years now. So um, yes. The, I think it's still going to be named Latina Practices of Oral History. And I'm really trying to get it to be worth four credits. It's a little bit of a struggle with the college right now because it's a three-hour class. We meet once a week for three hours. Um, and, uh, but it's worth four credits because there's so much, there's quite a bit of outside work. Like we go and do interviews. So, or that's ideally what I want. But the college is very resistant to like having you guys meet for three hours on one day a week as opposed to one and a half, two days a week for some reason. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. So other questions? <laughs>
Yeah. Um, yeah, we will probably be doing a, an interview trip to LA in the fall. And so the wonderful thing about Europe is that if you, anyone here in Europe? All right. So as you know, you can earn a credit, course credit or work study. Um, but the other thing is that they have some funding opportunities. So that will, that will cover, I think it's like they have these $500 grants. So um, it can cover travel for Europe students, which is really helpful because we don't actually have the funds. Like usually I cover renting a house because most of our trips are a week long. They're very intensive. And so I cover lodging um, and get people fed and stuff like that. But it really helps to have that Europe money for traveling. And there's also the Center for the Education of Women has a, a Riker fund that helps um, undergraduates engaging in research to do feminist-based research. Yeah. Any other questions? Hmm? Okay.